Some female journalists have become household names. We know where they went to college, but their college experiences are rarely publicized. The TCU newsroom has a large number of female employees, but what did collegiate female journalists have to endure to help us get where we are? To examine how far women have come in these respects, the progress made between two snippets of decades in American history must be analyzed. Honey, what's funny? Well, whenever we cook inside, Mom always does the cooking. But whenever we cook outside, you always do it. How come? Well, it's sort of traditional, I guess. Uh, you know, they say a woman's place is in the home, and uh, I suppose as long as she's in the home, she might as well be in the kitchen. American women in the 1950s were shaped by pop culture which was full of images of women caring for their home and children. Poems such as these and quotes such as, A man is in general better pleased when he has a good dinner upon his table than when his wife talks Greek, by Dr. Samuel Johnson, were commonplace. With images such as this, it is no wonder women believed they must solely be a good wife. Some women, however, were challenging this ideal, even though society typically considered it paranormal for women to attend college at all. Women were obtaining degrees at roughly half the rate of males. Texas Christian University, or TCU, was founded in 1873 as ADRAN, and by 1874 became the ADRAN Male and Female College. TCU was following the pattern of the rest of the nation. As reported in the SCIF issue that was distributed on October 27, 1950, there was two fellow to every gal. There were 2,836 men on campus and 1,417 women. So what did this mean for the journalism world? So are you. Just didn't work out, Walter. Well, it would have worked out if you'd been satisfied with just being editor and reporter, but not you. You had to marry me, spoil everything. His Girl Friday was released in 1940. With females in college and portrayed through the media in the journalism field, what did collegiate journalism look like, specifically at TCU? The first ever published GIF came out on September 19, 1902, and became a part of the journalism department in 1928. Women were breaking stereotypes just by attending TCU. However, typically women studied home economics and painted, while the men studied more serious degrees, such as the sciences. However, at TCU, women were going another step further and began working for the SCIF. They were also a part of the journalism club, Williams Writing Press Club. In the September 22nd issue in 1950, editor Jack Clark announced the new SCIF staff, where Eugenia Luger was named associate editor and Janelle Hart was given the position of society editor. Out of six positions at the SCIF, only those two were held by women. Although she was a staffer, Eugenia Luker's writing was featured only once compared to Jack Clark and Tommy Thompson's daily articles. Here, Jack Clark acknowledges Molly Roy and female staff members, but above his acknowledgement, a cartoon that makes fun of females in college. A beautiful woman is dressed in luxurious gowns, standing next to an older gentleman, with women gawking at her, to which she tells them, my dears, I majored in economics. The cartoon was running off the stereotype that women in college were simply going for their MRS degree. Male reporters were writing all articles, even those that featured female issues. Although articles that typically discussed women issues were written in ways that do not discuss much of substance, as they did for males. An article discussing female issues simply talked about if they should wear jeans when it is below freezing and still not lose any of their dignity. Other articles running were how to deal with social pressure of men and women studying together. However, this article only focused on the male aspect. Articles written for women focused on two issues, boys and clothes. Although it was a Baylor student's struggle to get noticed by boys, her advice of wearing a freshman cap worked and was deemed worthy enough to be printed to help TCU females get attention as well. In an article discussing girls' clothing in the cold weather, reporter Ted Allen said the fact that girls can't wear jeans in cold temperatures was not an issue for the gorgeous girls. While cold weather and fashion seemed to be an issue, not once did a woman report on the problem. This can also be seen on the TCU campus. In the intramural open house queen contest, male faculty and students decided, along with Tom Prouse, the director of physical education, that women would wear swimsuits and high heels to showcase their personality. This made front page news. Sometimes women did report. However, even then, the women couldn't get past the sexism. Even while Lona Patterson was reporting on campus, she was being told that all that mattered was that she plays the typical 1950s housewife role. In Lona Patterson's article, Ideal Woman Depends on Your Point of View, she quotes one of her male classmates, Charlie Horse. Horse said, The woman I marry need not be beautiful, charming, or rich. All I ask is that she recognize my needs. Patterson also discussed how women were having a difficult time finding a good man to be with, which seemed to be a common problem. In a letter called Call Us Cupid, a reader responded to the male opinion that females at TCU were unfriendly creatures who never smiled. She at first said she was angry about the comment, but soon realized that he was right and the women weren't smiling and seemed unfriendly. She ended up meeting the man and dating him, telling all female readers it pays to smile. It seemed to the skiff women's needs and wants revolved around boys and fashion with no deeper level or importance. 
Miss Baxter won a contest for her writing, and that article was featured next to one about students who procrastinated over their weekends. However, the story about Miss Baxter runs on roughly half the space that the procrastination story received, although procrastination is nothing new and nothing truly newsworthy. Just the same, associate editor Eugenia Luker was among 19 journalism students from the entire state to be honored by the Fort Worth professional chapter of Sigma Delta Chi. The story on her was simply given three graphs. Although stories about females and female bylines were few and far between, this gift did allow them to be staffed, while TCU was having a harder time to find employment for their female students. An article on student jobs in this gift on September 29th discusses 131 students looking for employment, half of them women. Student employment assistant Jim Burton reported that he had a hard time placing the females. Although women were present on the paper, the sexism and discrimination is evident in the paper itself. The world was changing. The women were attempting to promote new and different ideas, which would lead to more equality. Of realizing that the personal is political and therefore justifies political action uh, was one of the revolutionary ideas of the beginning of the women's movement. In 1963, the Equal Pay Act passed. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act passed. Women were determined that they be heard. College students and working women alike organized marches and protests to achieve equal rights in the workforce. In August of 1970, 50,000 women marched in New York, while 100,000 more marched across the country for equality. There seemed to be no stopping the women's desire for equality. Even the media image of women was changing. She was a role model for me, not just in, oh gee, I see Mary on TV and I really like Mary, but wow, what kind of woman and what kind of businesswoman created this? Thank you, Mary, for being such an inspiration to us all, all of us women in television. It seemed as though the world was on track to equality. However, the professional and journalism world was not progressing as quickly. A woman was quoted saying, The female doesn't really expect a lot from life. She's here as someone's keeper, her husband's or her children's. Even a medical school dean was quoted saying, We do keep women out when we can. We don't want them here, and they don't want them elsewhere either. Whether or not, they'll admit it. The journalism world didn't seem much better. In 1970, 25% of the editorial staff at Newsweek was female, but reporting was done solely by males. You'll never guess what! I just got a call from the school. I've been made editor of the school newspaper! TCU seemed to be doing well in the aspect of equality. 53% of the student population was female. In the TCU Bulletin, junior journalism major Kelly Robertson wrote that she was proud of the statesmanlike manner in which students, faculty, and trustees weathered the problems of the 60s without disruption to the educational program. Although the journalism field seemed to remain a hostile environment where women were still not given assignments as their male counterparts, TCU seemed to be creating a more equal playing field. In the September 25, 1970 issue of the SCIF, Chuck Hawkins reported that Director of Student Activities at TCU, Elizabeth Profer, felt women were discriminated against, but applauded the SCIF. She said, there are very few instances of equality in business among men and women. Women can expect to be paid less for doing the same work simply because they are women. She complimented the skiff for its balance of men and women on staff, especially for having a female editor-in-chief, Shirley Farrell. Females were holding the positions of editor-in-chief, managing editor, and contributing editor in the skiff in 1970. Shirley Farrell was the editor-in-chief, Susan Whittaker, managing editor, and Rita Immig was the contributing editor. However, out of the eight positions available, only those three were held by a woman. Male sports received a large portion of pages, if not a page in its entirety, every issue. However, when the females won a rifle tournament, they received only a couple graphs. No sports articles were ever reported by a woman, even when a female was the editor-in-chief. In contrast, covers like this started to become more commonplace. Both articles were written by women, Shirley Farrell and Barbara Allen. These articles were hard-hitting, newsworthy, and displayed on the front page in its entirety. It was only looking up. The women at the skiff were using their position to fight for equal rights. Rita Immig argued that the curfew rules were unfair and that the females on campus needed to stand up for what was equal. She questioned the 11 o'clock curfew placed on women and not men, saying, Why must girls be locatable for calls or emergencies after 11 and 1? Boys can't be located, and their great aunt could die too. Maybe it's time to quit the game. Lynn Blockman wrote about the women's liberation movement, but found that Dr. Gerardine Dominic, an accounting professor, was all for women's equality, but ultimately deemed it unnecessary. Blockman ends the article stating that Dominic indicated that the movement is for the random women and not the typical. Blockman also wrote an article about women receiving the ability to don ministry robes. 
She linked the new role back to the women's liberation movement. These articles were issues that faced women more than just boys and fashion. They were also written by female reporters. Female bylines in the 1970s were more commonplace than in the 50s, although the majority of issues affecting both male and females were still discussed by males. While some articles discuss women's liberation outright, there seemed to be a hint of dissatisfaction about the idea as well. Some articles touched on women's liberation treading carefully and almost jokingly. Susan Whitmaker, managing editor, wrote an article about how women need to be liberated from their lack of automobile knowledge. Ads such as this would run in the skiff and seemed almost commonplace. This was supposed to promote Evelyn Wood's reading dynamics, where she would tutor other students. However, to promote it, she used her sexuality and phrasing such as a hard proposition to beat. Instead of promoting her business or brain, she relied on her sexual appeal to gain viewership. The skiff relied on sexual appeal as well, with images such as leg nog, where Anne Price poses beautifully, they might add, showing off her legs on the cover of the December 15th issue. The start of a new year and new semester brought a new staff to the skiff. Johnning Livingood became editor-in-chief, Rita Immig, news editor, Shirley Farrell, managing editor, and Carol Nuckles, assistant managing editor. Once again, out of eight positions, only three were female. When Johnning Livingood took over the paper, female bylines appeared less frequently and smaller. Instead of females being called women, once again, headlines changed to co-ed. Shirley Farrell was given one byline on the front page the entire second semester on February 9th. The largest women's rights article in the spring of 1971 was Now Says Men Not Better. The article explained the women's liberation movement and their goals. However, there was no byline given to the article, and it was placed on page 7 amid an ad and other articles, instead of in a more prominent location. Though both Jack Clark and Shirley Farrell were both skiff editors, Shirley Farrell was only given a small section in the multiple who's who pages in the yearbook. Jack Clark was given an entire page to himself with images of support. Jack Clark was also featured on all the skiff pages. Shirley Farrell was not given nearly as much recognition. The differences between 1950 through 1951 and 1970 through 1971 shows improvement at the skiff. In the 1950s, articles involving women surrounded boys in fashion with little to no female bylines. In the 1970s, the female focus was on the women's liberation and surrounding impacts it has on the TCU campus as well as community. In the 1950s, there were two female staffers. By the 1970s, the number grew to three. The increase was only 4%, however, since two more positions were also added in 1970. In 1950, a woman would not have been given the role of editor-in-chief. The significance of Shirley Farrell as editor-in-chief can be seen in the Director of Student Activities Elizabeth Profer's admiration for the skiff. Twenty years brought a lot of social change to the United States and more opportunities for female students at TCU who wanted to work for the skiff. To understand the importance of female positions in collegiate journalism, the discrimination they faced before must be examined. The differences in the two decades show that women can gain social change, but must never be complacent. This is what I tell especially young women. Fight the big fights. Don't fight the little fight. If you don't get all the lines, if you're not where you should be, be the first one in, be the last one out, do your homework. Choose your battles. Don't whine and don't be the one who complains about everything. Fight the big fights.